welcome again and uh, welcome to this the last session of uh, building prayer altars session four I'd like to uh, especially welcome all those from other churches majority are from church of singapore bukitima but there's uh, also one there's people from at least 11 other churches and we have people joining from cambodia and uh, thailand as well so welcome god bless all of you let's continue you should have received the notes in the whatsapp group you can follow along with the notes so in this session of building prayer altars we're looking at session four we've seen what are prayer altars we've seen that they are best that's their biblical so there's a biblical theme all the way through scripture that continues into uh, the New Testament, and they're e engaging, they're not boring, they're, they're engaging us, so uh, one hour should seem like one minute, and then it's strategic. Strategically, it puts us in with other like-minded people and forms a network in a nation and across the nations, and we become part of that network. And It's strategic in that it brings us into our destinies. And lastly, it's T in that it's transforming. It transforms our lives. It transforms, if it's a family altar, transform family. A marketplace altar transforms the marketplace. Church altar transforms the church. National altar transforms the nation. But it all starts with the uh, personal prayer altar. Okay, so we've seen some sessions two and three, we've seen how uh, the tabernacle, the blueprint of the tabernacle that God gave to Moses reveals uh, a pattern for us in our own prayer altar, that the, the theme of God's people being his priests, going to the altar, offering sacrifices, and drawing the presence of God to push back the darkness, like in the Old Testament, as the priests would function properly at the altar, the whole nation was blessed. There was a, a blessing on the land even, as there was a proper worship in the land as the priests functioned. But that continued into the New Testament. Now we are spiritual priests. We are priesthood of all believers. And we don't offer up physical sacrifices, but spiritual sacrifices. And our heart is the altar that connects us with the heavenly altar. So we've looked at all of that. We looked at the altar, outer court activities, which is word, worship, washing. So the importance of reading the words and declaring God's word daily in our life. And that is something that, uh, you know, can cause us, our lives to be spiritually stagnant. If we don't read the word and pray every day in faith, then our lives become stagnant and we don't we don't have the authority that the Lord wants us to move in. So the outer court activities are the basic things of our Christian life. That is reading the word, praising him, uh, lifting up his name daily and thanking him. And then cleansing, going through a spiritual cleansing. Yes, we are cleansed by the blood of the lamb. We are righteous in him but we are to be holy and we do that through cleansing jesus has already purchased that has already done that with his precious blood but we have to apply it just as the priests had to apply the water from the brazen laver to their hands and their body before they could enter the holy place so the holy place and the holy of holies represents the heavenly tabernacle the heavenly temple where there's the altar of incense where there's the golden candlestick, where there's the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And we've been through that. That's the inner court activity. So that's the activities of entering or crossing over into the spiritual realm by faith, entering into his throne room. That's the spiritual realm. And then becoming watchmen. So that's where interceding as the spirit leads. So this is where we're caught up. So after reading the word, praising, thanking him and cleansing ourselves, we are qualified priests ready to enter in to the throne room of heaven. And in the throne room, that's the spiritual realm. So we can pr start praying in the spirit. I usually start just by praying in tongues because praying in tongues is praying what is perfect, praying the will of God. 
there's worship tongues, there's prayer tongues, there's warfare tongues. And the more you pray in tongues, the more the Lord will teach you. It's just like learning a new language. The, the more you do it, the more you will learn it. So you start praying in tongues and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal. And he starts, the Holy Spirit starts to give you revelation as to what you are to pray for. So at the prayer altar, it's not our agenda, it's God's agenda. It's not praying a shopping list of prayers that we think we should pray, but it's really tapping in and aligning with heaven and aligning with God's prayers. Because when we pray, it's his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, so the prayer altar links as a spiritual gateway that links us up with heaven so that we can pray prayers from heaven. If we pray prayers from earth, that is when we're not ready, we're not prepared, and we're not in the, the heavenly throne room, those prayers will just hit the ceiling. They hit the second heaven, the, the, the covering of darkness, and they're not really the, the will of God because we are to pray in the will of God. Like 1 John 5.14 says that uh, this is the confidence we have that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and if he hears us then we receive that which we ask of him but it must be according to his will and that is found we find out what that his will is in heaven because in the heavenly throne room that is where his will is released onto earth okay so we've been through that we've been through the prayer altars are best. We've been through the outer court activities of reading the word, and we recommend 10 chapters a day. If you do that, you can read through the whole Bible three times a year. So since we started in our church 2016, those that have been fully have read through the Bible and just coming to the 15th reading. So I started at the beginning of 2016, reading through from Genesis to Revelation. That means... I'm just about to finish my 15th reading. Before that, I had read the Bible all the way through, but not systematically, not from Genesis to Revelation. I'd read bits here, there, but I couldn't say how many times I had read, and it was very small portions. The principle is not 10 chapters. The principle is you read enough big chunks of Scripture. So it's not just dipping your, your spiritual foot into a puddle, it's not a puddle of scripture, it's a swimming pool of scripture. You can't soak in a puddle, but you can soak in a swimming pool. And then after reading his words, let the praise arise. So it's a sacrifice of thanksgiving, sacrifice of praise. Like the, in the Old Testament, the priests would come and offer up the fellowship offering, which is actually talking about our praise and our worship and, and thanksgiving unto God. And we do that. We praise him. We thank him. We press on in until the presence of God comes. We're surrounded by his goodness and his goodness leads us to repentance. So that's daily coming to cleanse our whole body. So we're cleansing our ears, eyes, mouth, heart, hands, feet, and bloodline. So I went through that last time. And as we do that, maybe as we're touching our ears, the Lord will remind us maybe of certain areas where we have done wrong. Maybe he will say, do you remember that piece of gossip that you heard the other day? You believed it. You took it into your heart and you started thinking wrong things about this person. So then you can repent of that. Forgive me, Father, for uh, thinking wrong things because of the gossip I heard. And I myself returned that gossip and spoke it to others. Forgive me. Have mercy on me, Lord God. Cleanse me. Cleanse my ears. That I can only hear what is true and holy and righteous. What is your word? Uh, so as you go through cleansing your, your whole body, soul, and spirit, uh, the Lord will remind you and show you areas of sin and if you've sinned during the day then there's areas of darkness that have come in so that darkness has to be pushed away and that's what happens at the prayer altar it's drawing his presence and pushing back the darkness <clears throat> because darkness if it remains can become defilements in our life that can defile other people okay so we've looked at uh, that the inner court is leading us to the point where we are interceding according to the will of God. We're praying for others through identification or repentance. Now, that's very important. It's not prayer that is judgmental prayer. Judgmental prayer is where we have made up our mind about a person and we say they are like this and we're asking God to do certain things in their life. So we've judged that person and we're sitting on the throne as judge. And then we're asking God and God is there before us like a servant. We're saying, God, 
this person like that, they're like this, they're like that. Would you come and do this in their life? Would you change this in their life? So you're actually commanding God to do things, telling God to do things, and he's become the one before the throne rather than the one on the throne. So it should not be like that. True prayer is where we come humbly before the Lord. We kneel and bow down before his throne, and we intercede and we cry out because of what Jesus has done on the cross. We pray, we cry out for breakthrough, whether we're praying for salvation of someone, praying for healing of someone, we're praying for deliverance of someone or whatever it may be, provision from God for someone or for some people group as the Holy Spirit leads. And then we cry out, remember the aspects of intercession that we identify with the people, then we agonize in the spirit, and then we stand in authority. is God has answered it and we can stand before the throne and then we declare and decree and we declare what the Lord is we declare identity of a person we decree destiny of a person so we're, we're declaring who they are in Christ and we're declaring what is their destiny what God is going to do in their life now today what I'm looking at is uh, the last one, which is the altar of blessing. So blessing ties this all together, as we will see. Before I do that, this material and more is available on my website. You can scan the QR code here. So on this website, uh, there's all that I've been teaching, plus a lot more. And you can get the prayer altars book, whether the hard copy or the soft copy. Okay, the e-copy, the soft copy is freely available for download. The hard copy, I'll just give a link to our church because we have, you have to get it through our church or through Eden Resources. Uh, but the, the link is there. Uh, and then there's a link also, there's links for teaching on personal prayer altar, family prayer altar, and even marketplace prayer altar. And it covers a lot more than I, I've been teaching. And I also have uh, prayer altar words where I go through from A to Z words related to prayer altars and I've made made a video I've got halfway through that and that's I'm doing every week and I'm updating that okay so there's a lot of uh, resources there that you can look at I'll put this up again at the end so you can get the QR code if you don't get it now okay so this session I want to look at the altar of blessing this is something we've been teaching in our church, talking about entering into the culture of blessing, which is actually the culture of the kingdom. And the prayer altar is a place of blessing. So during this session, we will see as we build prayer altars that they are places of blessing that cause us to be channels of blessing and partake in the Abrahamic blessing for ourselves, our families, future generations, our workplaces, churches, societies, and nations. So you remember Abraham, God told Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing to all the families of the earth through you. You'll be a blessing to the families of the earth. And in the New Testament, it says by faith, we are of the seed of Abraham. So we partake in this blessing. And how did Abraham partake in this blessing? Through building altars. As he goes in the land, from Genesis 12 onwards, you see he's building altars that cover from north to south the land of Israel, which now is possessed by his descendants, his direct physical descendants, that is the, the Jews. Uh, but we are his spiritual descendants. So the altar is a place of blessing. Like when Moses was taught by God how to build the altar, it says, an altar of earth you shall make to, for me. And you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings. So burnt offering is offering everything. Your whole body is a living sacrifice. Your peace offering. That's our offerings of praise and thanksgiving. Your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. So here God records his name. He writes his name on the altar. And remember our altar, first and foremost, is our heart. And his name is his nature, his very nature and character, authority a manifestation of himself and empowering to do his purposes. So his name is N, his nature, A, his authority, M, 
his manifestation and E, his empowering. He puts that over us. That's his presence coming upon us and he blesses us at the prayer altar. And the role of the priest, as you look in the Old Testament, and I believe this role is continuing into the New Testament. We are different kinds of priests now, but we still have these three basic activities as priests. Deuteronomy 10 verse 8 is a threefold blessing of the priesthood. Let's read this together. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him and to bless his name unto this day. So here you see the tribe of Levi, that's the priests, were set apart to firstly bear the Ark of the Covenant. That's to bear his presence. The Ark of the Covenant is the very manifest presence of God. So to bear on their shoulders the very presence of God, which is his name, that is his blessing. So bearing the Ark is carry his blessing in our life that he blesses us secondly to stand before the lord to minister unto him so that is to bless the lord bless the lord oh my soul so minister to him by blessing him through our praise and our worship and we bless him as we do his will as well and we we worship him even through our work whatever we do as unto the lord we bless his name and then lastly, and to bless in his name unto this day. So the role of the priest was to bless others and bless others in the name of the Lord, not in their own name, but in God's name. So the role of the priest is he blesses us, like we carry his presence. Then we bless him in return. In our, at, at the prayer altar is where we bless him through our praise and our worship. And then we bless others. If you look closely at this, you see that there's a cycle of blessing. So it starts off, he blesses us. This is to the altar. So as we have a revelation and encounter with him as the blesser, and especially through the word, that's why it's so important to read the word. Jesus is the word. He's the living word. So as we read the word, it's a revelation of who God is in Jesus, particularly. So the altar is founded on this. So reading the word is actually encountering Jesus afresh. And he comes to bless us. So it's a revelation and encounter with the Lord. He comes to bless us so that we can bless him. There's no good in us that can bless the Lord. But through what Jesus has done and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he enables us to, to, to bless him, to worship him. So at the altar, we hallow his name and we consecrate our life. We cleanse ourselves, which leads to further blessing. Remember what I was talking about, that as we consecrate ourselves, then we can rise up and we can say, I'm a qualified priest. I'm an able minister of the new covenant. I'm an effective ambassador of the kingdom by the blood of Jesus. I'm redeemed out of the hand of the devil. And I gave you that you can speak out that that prayer that you can speak out of, of cleansing and that's actually blessing yourself you're you're speaking blessing over yourself which is who god has made you to be your identity and also your destiny so we bless him and then at the prayer altar we bless others that's the destination of the prayer altar is to to bless others so we can intercede for others and then declare and decree into their life blessing to come over them so that they too can become a blessing and we speak blessings into lives and even into lands, as we will see. So firstly, he blesses us. So we must receive his blessing like Jacob and like Jabez. Disobedience blocks this blessing. Cleansing releases it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. So like Jabez... In uh, First Chronicles 4.10, you see it's outlining the line of Judah. Judah means praise. But in the midst of this line of Judah, there's one character called Jabez. And he was his name means pain, one who gives pain. So he was someone who gave his family and others around him great pain. We don't know exactly. It doesn't say much about how he did that. He was probably born in pain. 
as his mother had great pain more than normal in, in childbirth, but he, uh, in his life, he was giving others pain. And so he cries out this to the Lord. He says, Lord, you would bless me indeed. Enlarge my territory. Your hand would be with me. You would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. So what he's actually asking for is, Lord, bless me and expand me in my ministry so that I don't cause pain to others. In other words, I bless others. I become a channel of blessing. That's what he was crying out. So it's not wrong to say, bless me, Lord. Bless me. And at the prayer altar, that's what we're asking the Lord to do. Through After the cleansing, we're, we're declaring that we are blessed by the Lord, who we are in our identity and uh, our destiny, who we are, who God is making us to be. Jacob as well. Remember Jacob as he was coming back to the promised land, Genesis 32, 26. At the brook Cherith, he meets uh, the, no, the, the brook uh, Peniel. He meets up with God face to face and he wrestles with God. He says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So at the prayer altar, actually, we wrestle with the Lord and we're, we're crying out for him to bless us. Why? Not for ourselves, but so we can be a blessing to others so that God will speak to us who he wants us to intercede for and to declare over and to see blessing come into their lives. And then we bless him. We bless him by spending time in his presence, hearing his word, praising and worshiping. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So because of his benefits that we've just been talking about, all the blessings that he blesses over us, then we bless him in return. And then from that comes blessing others. So as priests, we are to bless lives and lands. We bless through prayer, face to face, and in our deeds as we are blessed to be a blessing. So we bless others in our, at the prayer altar through our intercession for them. But then during the day, we might actually meet up with the person we've been praying for, and we can actually bless them face to face. So how do we bless? It's in imparting identity and destiny into people a definition of blessing is blessing is a declaration so remember what i said at the, the final point six of the prayer altar the final activity is declaring and decreeing and blessing is a form of declaring and decreeing and so once we have the authority we can start declaring and decreeing especially in blessing so blessing is a declaration. It empowers someone to prosper, succeed, and overflow. So speaking blessing over someone is not just lit liturgy and going through the motions and just saying words over a person. It's actually empowering someone to prosper in the Lord. The word in the, in the Hebrew Old Testament, barak, is either to kneel before someone or to bless and it's to empower them to prosper in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, it shows more the posture in the word, which is of humility and kneeling before a person to bless them. So putting others' needs before yourself, but in great authority and power. And then in the New Testament, the word used is talking more about uh, the content of the blessing. The word is eulogio, where we get eulogy from. The sad thing is many times today we leave the eulogy until someone has passed away and then at the funeral only we speak the eulogy over a person eulogy literally means you which is healthy or good or well and logio which means word so it's a healthy a well or a good word that's spoken over someone so unfortunately many times a person's eulogy is spoken at their funeral after they've died it actually should be spoken, the eulogy of the blessing over a person should be spoken while they're still living. From a child, from right young as a child, speaking blessing over them. And the priests were called to do this, and God even gave them a blessing to bless the people. Moses received this from God, and Moses then would have shared this with Aaron and the priests, and Aaron and the priests would have 
spoken this over the people. So I'm sure you you all know this very well. Numbers 6, 22 to 27. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. I just spoke a whole message of this in our church. If you go to the site that I gave the link to, you can actually watch that message. I, I haven't got time to go into all of this, but I look into the contents of this blessing. And it's actually asking uh, God to bless the person in every area of their life. And it's putting his name over them. So his very character and authority, his, manifest, his, his nature, his authority, his manifestation, his empowering over a person. Then the priest would use hands in this shape together and as you put them together it forms the hebrew letter shin which is short form for shaddai and that's the name of god el shaddai which means the mountain god of the mountain the god the mighty almighty god uh if you know about star trek there's spock there and spock his symbol always was to put the hand like that and say live long and prosper and he was the actor who played him leonard nimoy was actually a jew and so he wanted to sneak in the ironic blessing into Star Trek. So when you watch Star Trek and see that, it's actually inspired by the ironic blessing. So the priests would do this, but it has to be from the presence of God. When, firstly, when uh, Aaron did it to the people, so he had learned it from Moses, and then he memorized, may the Lord bless you and keep you, etc. In Hebrew, of course, he spoke it in Hebrew. In Leviticus 9.22, this is the first time he spoke it over the people. It says, after that, Aaron raised his hands towards the people and he blessed them. Then after presenting the sin offering, the burnt offering and the peace offering, he stepped down from the altar and nothing happened. So Moses saw this and he said, that's not the right way of doing it. And then in verse 23, it says, and Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and bless the people and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then it says that the fire came down from heaven onto the sacrifice, onto the altar and the people fell over on their faces. They screamed out and they fell down because the power of God was so great. So the first time when Aaron spoke the ironic blessing, there was no power. Why? Because he had not been in the presence of God. But as soon as Moses took him in the tent of meeting, that is where they met God face to face. And then when they came out, they, they themselves have met with God. They themselves have been blessed by God. We can only give to others what we have been given ourselves by God. So if we've not been at the prayer altar daily, then we can't receive that to give that blessing to others. So our, if, we, if we do speak blessing over others, it will be dry blessing. Nothing much will happen. But if we want to see powerful things happen, to bless people, we must be in God's presence first. And that's at the prayer altar. There's a structure to our blessing. So in the New Testament, of course, the name that we, we speak blessing in is the name of Jesus, particularly that his name encompasses all of the blessings. And David, when he prayed blessing over the people, it says he blessed the people in the name of the Lord, 1 Chronicles 6, 2, 16, 2. And so it's this is a formula that we can use. We can say, I bless you in the name of Jesus, that he or that the father may, and then you pray the blessing over the person. So it's a very simple structure. If you want, you can still use the structure of the ironic blessing, which is may the Lord bless you. So remember, it's not us blessing. We don't say, I bless you. That God you have to add on that may that God may or I bless you in the name of Jesus that he may do this. So it must be in his name. We don't have in ourselves any real blessing except for God's blessing. So it's God who's blessing the person. So when we bless, bless the person, the first thing to do is look eye to eye into the person's face. And if they can't look you eye if they turn their head away they can't look you in the eye that means they're not ready to receive the blessing and the best thing to say to them is says is there anything i have done 
that you can't look me in the eye to bless you? Is there anything that I have done that's hurt you or offended you? And if the person says, yes, you said this, you did this, then you say, forgive me for doing that. And if they release that forgiveness, say, yes, I forgive you, then you can continue the blessing. So there must be a willingness to receive. So if they can't look you in the eye, because the eye is the windows of the soul, they can't look you eye to eye, that means they will not be receiving that blessing. But once they can look you in the eye, then you say, I bless you in the name of Jesus, that he may, and then you continue the blessing. So let's have a look at the contents of the blessing. So one example, you can say, what words should you use to bless others? I bless you in the name of Jesus, that the Father may bless you. I bless you that peace and joy of God may come upon you and wash through every part of your being, physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. Amen. So that's an example of a blessing. And if you look at that, it covers every area of life, which actually the ironic blessing also does. And I cover that in my message if you go to, to my website. So bless, you can say, spells B-L-E-S-S. -S. So you bless a person in their body, that's for health and protection, in their labor, that's for their work and their ministry, in their emotions, that's for their emotional stability, social life, that's in their human relationships, and spiritual life, that's their relationship with God. These are the five main areas you pray blessing over and the Lord by his spirit will lead you to pray for to, to bless a person, particularly in an area they need the most. OK, so be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And the more you spend at the prayer altar in the spirit, the more sensitive you become to the Holy Spirit. So when you bless and now when I bless people, sometimes the Lord will give me a vision. And I bless out of that vision or he gives me words over a person. So I know it's. I'm praying for maybe a relationship problem that they're going through, or it may be some problem in their work or ministry. I want to bless them in that area particularly. And you can even bless pre-believers. This one I got from uh, the book by Roy Godwin. And he's the, uh, he, he now he's just left it, but he's he was running the Folder Brennan uh, Retreat Center in South Wales. Someone, a team has taken over from him. He's gone more into an international ministry. And he was talking about the power of blessing in that place. And they saw many, many miracles, many healings and salvations as well. There's one time this guy came and Roy Godwin was not there, but one of his staff was there. And this guy was actually a photocopy salesman and he come, had come to sell a photocopier and so he went into the office and the lady who was there uh, looked at the the brochure of the photocopiers and everything and before the man left and before they decided upon which photocopier to buy uh, she just felt prompted to say can I bless you and uh, so the man said yes you know if people if you ask people can I bless you? Most will say yes. And so she she said, firstly, let me take you on a tour of the retreat center. So they would just go out from, from the office into the gardens. There's a high cross on the hill. And then at the end, they would go into a chapel. And in the chapel, the man just sat down and, and she said, can I bless you now? He said, yes. And she just blessed this simple prayer, which she had been taught. She had, she had just been taught to pray this over a pre-believer. It says, I bless you in the name of Jesus that God may reveal to you everything you need to know and enable you to be fully who you were made to be and that you receive everything you need to know so that the fullness of life might be released to you. She just prayed this and, and he, he just uh, smiled and he got up and, I, and they arranged the details of the photocopier, but then he left. And as he was leaving and driving in the car, he stopped in the driveway and he looked across. And as he looked across, there was just one single beam of light coming from heaven onto the cross, the high cross that was in the, the retreat center's ground. And as this beam of light hit the cross, suddenly revelation flooded him. When he was young, he went to Sunday school at church 
and, and he is taught all about Jesus on the cross. And all that, that revelation of who Jesus is and what he'd done on the cross and what he'd done for him flooded into his heart. And that moment, he accepted Jesus into his heart and he became a believer in the Lord Jesus. And then he went off. And later, his story was actually told on a Christian radio station. And it was told because little did this lady know in the retreat center, he was a famous uh, Welsh rugby player previously. He had been in the Welsh rugby team and he was very well known. But she was a lady from England. She never didn't know who he was. And it became big news. This uh, famous rugby guy had become a believer in the Lord Jesus. And it was through this blessing that was spoken over him so this lady had just spoken in faith this blessing didn't know the whole situation but it, by the holy spirit the holy spirit used this and she was empowering him to prosper and the, of course the greatest way to prosper is salvation coming into salvation so that's a beautiful story and when you pray blessing over someone there's a suitable blessing for them Genesis 49, verse 28, where Jacob was blessing his children, it says, this is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. So there's a suitable blessing that God has for us. And the place, the first place of blessing, of course, the first place is at the pr your own personal prayer altar, where you're blessing yourself, asking God to bless you. But then in your family prayer altar, it's the ideal place to release blessing, especially for the parents towards their children. Do you know that the Jews do this every Friday at Shabbat Shalom? When I went to Israel, I actually joined in a Shabbat Shalom. It's a Messianic Jewish family. And we went to their house as a group of us. The, the, the wife firstly took us out and taught us Jewish dances outside their house. And then we went in and before the meal, they gathered all of us plus their children and the father spoke blessing over each one of their children. And then he spoke blessing over each one of us. And then sang some Jewish songs and had a prayer. It was a very, very beautiful time. But do you just imagine in Jewish families every single Friday night, because Shabbat, Shabbat starts on Friday night and goes through to Saturday night. But on the Friday night, around the world in Jewish families, they have this Shabbat Shalom, where the, the parents, especially the father, will pray blessing over the children. So that's why the Jewish people are so blessed. Do you know that the Jews make up a very small percentage of the world population? Very tiny, but about 0.2% uh, of the world's population. But you know, 20% of Nobel Prizes are won by Jewish people. And the high places on all the mountains of the, the different areas of society, Jews are in the high places of prominence. Conspiracy, it's because the Jews are being blessed by their parents every single week. Therefore, they're being empowered to prosper. It's a very powerful thing. And the church, we should be doing this because we are grafted into that, that vine. We're uh, grafted into that olive tree. So we should be doing this regularly and as family altar. The enemy is trying to stop this. I've realized how difficult it is to try and start up a family prayer altar. The enemy try and stop it as much as he can because it's very powerful. If God's people come together as a family and blessing one another in the family, it's going to be very, very powerful. So blessings of a family prayer altar. How do we start building an effective family prayer altar. I did mention it a bit in lesson one, session one. We start by strengthening, strengthening our own personal prayer altar. If we, if we try and do a family prayer altar and we're not having our own personal prayer altar, it's going to fail. And I, I recalled my own testimony in that. You know, I, I thought family prayer altar was a time where me as the, the, the father was going to teach the children, you know, and and it, it ended up terribly, and it often ended up with arguments. But it should start with our own personal prayer altar, especially as the father of the household. If, if there's a father in the household, the father is the head of the household, is responsible spiritually. Okay, so drawing his presence, pushing back the darkness, seeing personal transformation is the first step. That's the personal prayer altar. 
And then, as I said, you can, if, if there's only one of you in the family who is a Christian, is a believer, then you can start to build your family prayer altar at home by just placing yourself in, in the home. Like when I first started in, in our house, I started in the living room so that I would be declaring into the whole household. Now I don't do that because the Lord has, has come. Uh, but you can start by so building your personal altar in your home. You set yourself in your home. And then you start cleansing your home. So as part of your, pers your personal prayer altar, you cleanse yourself. But in your intercession time, in the spirit, in the throne room, you start to cleanse the home. You start to ask forgiveness on behalf of your family. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins. Forgive us for our iniquities. And you cleanse the bloodline. So cleansing the bloodline of your family is part of that cleansing your household, cleansing your home. And then cleansing from defilements maybe of uh, idol worship or false altars in your home, cleansing the defilements of sin that have taken place in your home, cleansing the home, and you cleanse as you're reading God's word out, as you're praising, as you're worshiping, as you're cleansing the bloodline. All of this is cleansing your family, cleansing your home. So fill your home with worship, prayer, and the words. Of course, be sensitive to others who are in the house, so if, if you're praying loud in tongues and others who are not non-believers in your house are complaining, you know, don't just stubbornly continue doing that. Go into your room and privately do it. Okay. Uh, so you, you're not stumbling others around you. The principle is love, not to stumble people around you, but to release the fragrance of the Lord into your house. And then you carry the presence of God in thought, word, and deed. So if, if your family sees you as a hypocrite, like they see your anger always bursting out, they're, they're seeing uh, so, so many nasty things that you're saying to them, then that's not going to, to draw the family together into the family altar. So when you have got to the point where the family is coming together, then you can use this next year in our church, we're starting uh, fat wraps FAT stands for Family Altar Time, and RAPS are the five activities that take place at the family altar. So this is roughly based on the prayer altar, the personal prayer altar. Instead of starting with reading God's Word, you start with worship, and then read a portion of God's Scripture. So in the FAT RAPS, we have two songs, and there's links to YouTube videos that you can show as a family and, and just sing with those. But if you, one of your members can play guitar or play an instrument, then you can have a live worship. And then read, it doesn't have to be 10 chapters, of course. You can just read a few chapters as a family together. And then just talk about how to apply what you've read, what, what God is speaking to you through that passage. Just be long. You can just a few minutes share what God says to you through that reading of the word and then pray together as a family. And you're praying identificational prayer. So you're praying even for your extended family as well and repenting on their behalf, praying for salvation of those that don't know the Lord in your family, praying for healing, praying for provision, whatever. However, the Lord by his spirit is leading you into prayer. And then you speak blessing over each other. And you can use the, the example blessings I've given you in the notes. There are many example blessings, but Ultimately, it's to, to pray what God wants you to bless the other person. So blessing parents, spouse, and children. You can also have your children blessing you. Like in, in our house, uh, my kids also will bless me and my wife, and my wife and myself will bless one another as well, spouse, blessing spouse. So when you start, you can, you can start by one minute thanking that person You're, I see that you have a heart for this. I see that you you're really are excelling in this area. So it's lifting the person up and encouraging them. And then one minute, maybe asking forgiveness. If they can't look you in the eye or you know there's something that you've hurt them. When, I, when we first started this as a family, I had to actually get down before my children and to ask forgiveness for the way I treated them in the past. And it ended up we were crying together. And then after that, they were ready to receive the blessing, so I speak the blessing. And I remember my daughter just burst into tears when I spoke blessing over her. And my son had smiled from ear to ear 
as I was blessing him. Okay, so this is a format that you can use in your family prayer altar. And then there is, uh, this is what you'll be learning in our church. We have uh, family foundations where we learn about uh, blessing generations. There's critical times that you can use these words of blessing. Blessing at conception, blessing at pregnancy, blessing or blessing during the pregnancy, blessing at the birth, when the birth, blessing the child at birth, blessing the toddler, blessing the adult, uh, the uh, adolescence coming into puberty. And this in our church, we started having the princess ball where girls going into puberty from the age of when they get to the age of 13 they become a woman and for boys as well at the age of 13 become a man um, in many churches now they're starting to to use like in the jewish calendar they they have bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah which is for boys and girls coming into adulthood in the church uh it's called bar baraka which is the blessing of a boy coming into manhood and bat baraka a blessing of a woman coming in or a girl coming into womanhood and we're hoping to start that on a regular basis in our church and then of course a marriage blessing one another and old age young people blessing the older generations and then lastly there's the blessing of the land you know the land speaks about the land of of uh, where your family is, your household is the is a land, and a house can be defiled. And so as you start to not prayer altar in the house, it actually brings cleansing into that house. And in workplaces as well, workplaces can be defiled because of various sins over areas. Uh, so blessing the land is an extension. You bless lives and you bless lands through the prayer altar. Blessing lands is particularly for the more corporate prayer altars where you're blessing as a family, you're blessing, you're blessing your whole family as in your marketplace ministry, you're blessing your whole business area. Your church, as it starts up a prayer altar, it's blessing the area around the church in the society. And uh, of course, a national prayer altar is blessing the whole nation. So the land is polluted by sin. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, there was a curse upon the ground, upon the land. And you see the further uh, sins of mankind that actually bring specific curses into lands. Uh, so I'm not going to go through this because the time is running out. But you can look through this in the notes. And there's links here to, to the specific sins that bring a defilement into lands. So there's sexual perversion, there's injustice, there's bloodshed and violence, which can include suicide and abortion. There's broken covenants, such as uh, divorce, broken marriages. There's unfaithfulness and idolatry. Okay, and all of those things can bring a curse upon the land. But at the prayer altar, there's a healing of the land that happens. So I'm sure we all know this. Let's read this together. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Okay, so healing of the land, forgiving of the sin, that's the cleansing of the person, but healing of the land, that's the cleansing of the land. And at the prayer altar particularly, you'll find that the Lord wants to cleanse the land, which speaks about the areas of society. And I'm sure you've heard the seven mountains. I like this diagram because it compiles it into one mountain, but it's seven areas on that one mountain and in society you find that there's firstly family because family is the is the foundation of a nation if the family fails the nation fails so the family is actually the right at the the foundation of the mountain and then there's media education arts entertainment government business and religion all of those contribute towards emotional health and well-being uh, that's the family. 
media, education, arts and entertainment contribute to defining worldview in the nation, beliefs and values. The government interprets and enforces the law. Business talks about prosperity and economy. And then religion is God, morality and values. Now, where those things are defiled, then there's the curse upon the land. And there's a defilement in the land because of sins of the people. But in Isaiah 2, 21, it says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and the nations shall flow to it. So God wants to heal the land. Of course, that healing is only fully realized when Jesus returns. But now as the church and as priests, we have a role in bringing an impact and an influence on the mountains of this of, of this world and we can bring healing into certain areas when revival comes you see healing comes over whole areas of land like in the welsh revival 1904 there was healing over a land in the sense that uh crime stopped over that land the police stations closed down and were used uh, for the choirs to go and to sing Christian songs, pubs closed down. No one was getting drunk anymore. Instead, people were going to pubs for Bible reading and Bible study. Uh, so there's a transformation in the land. In some areas, you actually see a physical transformation. Like when the Jews returned to Israel, it was desert. But now uh, after they've returned, the desert has blossomed like a rose and you, you see and all of the irrigation in the land that God has given the wisdom to the Jews to, to do irrigation and the land has literally blossomed because God has taken the curse off. There's one story I heard in England where uh, Roy Godwin was telling this. He said that in the south coast of England, there is a fish fishing community and they started to realize that the fish had died out in the area they were fishing. And they didn't know what to do. That was their livelihood. And so someone had been to Folder Brennan in Wales and said, why don't we bless the sea, bless the fish, bless the, that, that, that whole area. And so they went in their boats and they started blessing, blessing the sea, blessing the, right down to the ground, to the land underneath and the fish. And what happened afterwards was truly amazing, truly like the biblical uh, stories of Jesus saying, put the net on the other side and they, they caught a multitude of fish. God literally healed the sea and the fish in the land started coming back. Uh, so there is a physical healing of, of land as well that comes as people start to bless. And this is all part of the prayer altar. Okay, so in your notes, I've given you activities that you can do to bless others and example blessings that you can speak over them. And so you, you can look through that and blessing areas. I've also given you a, a resource where you can do prayer walking and you can go around the area. Now, when I go outside and I walk past HTV blocks, I'm blessing, I'm blessing the areas, blessing the people around. And there's certain prayers that I include there that you can use in that blessing. And all of this is part of the prayer altar. It's because remember prayer altar is not just time and a place it's a whole lifestyle and it should lead to a lifestyle of blessing blessing that uh, sees people and places being set free of course the uh, marketplace prayer altar is another aspect of that and i haven't got time to go into that that's, that's a whole topic by itself but if you go to the here the uh, my web page there's a lot more uh, teaching that you can listen to there's videos there's audio tracks and there's downloads of uh, PDF files as well you can find out more on this but above all else you need to experience it yourself okay so when I teach this I hope it, it's not head knowledge my prayer and my hope is that you will enter into the reality of building a strong and effective prayer altar so let me pray uh, for each one of you right now 
And then after that, if there's any further questions that you have uh, that we can address as a group and I can answer. And also I want to hear any testimonies, anything that you have learned from these four sessions, things which God has spoken to you, or maybe things that you've started to apply these things about prayer altar and testimonies God has, has given you. So if there's any of those after I pray, you can put it in the comments or uh, you can speak it out and I will try and answer as best as I can. So let's uh, lift up our hands and let's pray. Father God, I want to pray for everyone here right now, all 50 of us, Lord God. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit, you'll just pour out upon us right now, pour over our lives right now. Lord, let your fire on the altar of our hearts increase. Lord, I pray you give us a hunger and a thirst for your presence. Lord, I pray, Father, each one of us, give us a fresh encounter with you, Lord God. Oh, because Abraham built altars to, to you who had appeared to him. Come and appear to us, Lord God. Come and show us your way. Come and fill us with your spirit. Lord, we need you, Lord God. Lord, I pray, Father, you'd work deep in our hearts right now to draw us deeper into you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, for what you've revealed to us in your word, the pattern, the blueprint you gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. And that is for us today as your, we are your priests. We're the priesthood of all believers. So Lord, I pray, help us, Lord, to start building a strong and effective personal prayer altar. And even within our own families, you'll teach us how to do that. Oh Lord, I pray, Father, we would not just go through this as a, uh, as a legalistic exercise lord god but it would be something that burns in our heart there's passion in our heart to see your name glorified lord so i pray for every single one of us wherever we're from whether we're from in singapore whether we're from cosbt or any other church whether we're in cambodia in thailand or any other nation lord would you come right now and fill us with your holy spirit overwhelm us with your presence lead us into a powerful experience with you lord where we are building not just our own personal altars but our family altars and lord in our workplace as well we would see those altars that will see a transformation in lives and land lord god and even in our churches or oh, take us deeper and deeper lord lead us and guide us in your holy ways lord we ask and pray this and all the people of God said, Amen. 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 Are there any uh, questions or Amen. even testimonies you want to share? In chat, let me have a look at the chat. Where's the chat gone? Well, greetings from Cambodia. Yes, Makara, greetings. God bless you. We pray that in Cambodia, there will be prayer altars springing up all over Cambodia to bring revival in that land in the mighty name of Jesus. Okay, anybody have a question or a, a testimony, something you'd like to share? Just unmute yourself and speak. Uh, hello, Pastor Tim. Hi, who's this? Uh, yes, yeah, I'm Rebecca. Okay. In Cambodia, yeah. Uh, Hi. When you take today, uh, I uh, the word you text me, correct me to the pray altar with family. Wow! Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. <laughs> okay. Thank, Pastor. Is, is this your first session? Yes, yeah, your um, first for me. First one. Okay, well, God bless you. Yeah, yeah, Pastor. Thank yeah. you. So you can go to the further resources. You you missed the first three. Uh, so maybe Makara can help you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay thank, thank you. Pastor. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah. Rebecca came last week because uh, I prayed with her. Who is that? Sorry. Candy. I'm saying that I think Rebecca came last week. Oh, Rebecca. We yeah. prayed together. So I think she's saying that first time, but she. Oh, okay. So you have been to the previous lessons. Okay. Hello, Pastor Tim. 
Yes. Yeah, yeah I'm Kim. Yeah, good evening. Yeah. I, I just wonder, just now you mentioned about uh, the spiritual realm against the darkness of warfare. Then how do you know you possess the tongue against this darkness of warfare? How do you know? When we speak in tongues, it, we're supposed yes. to communi communicate with our Lord and which the darkness they may not know. But how do you know you have very promoted to that level? I think when I was talking about uh, warfare tongues, yes, like for me, um, my tongues actually sound different. If I'm praising, I, I realize that my my tongue sounds more like a, a Spanish kind of language. <laughs> yeah. If I'm just uh, like singing singing in tongues or speaking, and I realize I'm praising the Lord. If I'm praying, it yeah. it sounds more like Hebrew kind of a tongue. Okay. Uh, if it's if I'm there's an African tongue that I have that is like warfare, you know, it's like very oh. aggressive, and I, I realize I just know that I'm engaging in warfare in speaking in tongues. And as you mentioned that you have, I uh, um, in, in various areas, suppose in school or any center, and how yes. about those uh, is different like temple, Chinese temple, or those uh, Buddhist center. So when you engage with those. Uh, speak in tongues so do you realize you change in any of your tone or your or how how, how do you perceive it because today i went to the buddhist temple yes so i speak in tongue i wonder whether it is effective now you know what i mean i may not know how do you know i mean it's, it's by faith i mean when you speak yeah. in tongues you're speaking out in faith uh, so you may not even realize the results of what you're praying. Um, but if you're doing it in faith, I, I've been through times where I've gone past temples or I've, I've been past where they have uh, maybe a funeral and they've, they've got the rites of other religions and they're singing songs. And I just start speaking in tongues and I realize God is giving me prayer. I'm, I'm speaking out something. I don't know what, uh, but I realize that I'm actually engaging in some kind of a warfare um but don't don't always understand what you're 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 doing you're speaking it out by faith okay. yeah so but this 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 must be also like in your personal prayer altar in your house yeah as you're having that time you you will go into times of warfare as well as you're interceding for others because there are spiritual powers holding a person back maybe from uh, opening their heart to the lord or maybe a, a spirit that's causing sickness in that person. So you'll find yeah. that you can go into spiritual warfare over that person as you're interceding for them. Okay. But the result may not be, uh, it may take longer time than yeah, you expected. Yeah, the result right. is totally in the Lord's hands. Yeah, it's totally yeah. in his hands. Yeah. Mean, your responsibility is to pray according to the will of God. It's yeah. God who answers the prayers. Yes, it's, yes. In his, in his timing. Yeah. Yeah, amen, amen. And something I want to share also, yeah. Uh, Hebrews. How come I? Yeah. Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of the Lord is living and powerful, yeah. and sharper than any two each sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joys yeah. and marrow. And is a descendant of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there's no creatures hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So yeah, when yeah. something Holy Spirit's prompt prom you, then you must do it in his time. Yeah, if, you know, that, yeah. that verse is talking yeah. about the power of God's word yeah. yes. to deal with our own life. Yeah, particularly, but it can also talk about others, but it's talking about thoughts and intentions that are against God's word in our life. Yeah. And as we read more of God's word, then it's like a sharp sword. There's two yeah. kinds of swords of God's word. The Hebrews is talking about a sword like a surgeon's sword, because at the time of Christ, uh, they, they would use swords. The surgeons would actually use swords for surgery. You know, it sounds terrible yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. It's talking about that which cuts and divides and yes. so the word of God actually divides our thoughts and intentions and reveals that which is right, that which is wrong. And then in 
Ephesians 6, where it talks about the, the sword of the spirit. That's yeah. an offensive sword. That's talking about the kind of sword the Romans used in those days to fight with the enemy. So that's talking about the, using the word in spiritual warfare. So, you know, even as uh, I'm at our prayer altar, there are many times where I'm reading the word, going through my 10 chapters of the day, the Lord will highlight particular verses. And then during the time of intercession, I use those that word in warfare. Yes, to speak yes into that's the right. Situation. Yeah. So that's that, right. Hebrew is talking more about the, uh, like a surgery of God's word, the sur surgeon of God's word. And then for the Ephesians 6, it's more like the offensive kind of sword. Okay, I see in the note in the uh, comments from Jack Chan. I didn't know we had Jackie Chan with us today. Thank you. Uh, the past few years ago, God shared that I am a prophet and priest. I didn't know what it's about. Okay, yes. So that's that came as a real revelation to me. This is Jesus is is a prophet, priest, and king. So we have that ministry as well. So the outer courts is our priestly ministry, reading the word of praise and worship and of cleansing that's the priestly ministry offering sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise and the prophetic ministry is when, when we're in the holy place that's our revelation because the prophets would receive revelation by the spirit and then they would intercede for the people and so revelation and intercession and then in the holy of holies that's our kingly ministry that's where we stand before the throne and we are standing in the place of authority to de declare and to decree over people's lives or over situations yeah so that that is uh, something very powerful okay any other questions so thank you that's more of a testimony so th thank you uh, jack for for that okay if not uh then it's a few activities to follow up from this if you want to you don't have to do this uh, if you have a testimony or any word of thanksgiving you can write a short feedback testimony and send it to that's the whatsapp that <clears throat> joseph has been using to contact you so send any testimony or feedback to him and then i will receive that uh, you can also follow up by joining if you're in our church church of singapore book of Timo, we have what's called 10 by 10 groups where there's a group of up to 10 people reading 10 chapters. And so it's like an accountability group. Uh, and every day <clears throat> you read the 10 and you write down what you've read. And then one verse that speaks to you and a short prayer out of that one verse. Okay. And then of course, that's not your full prayer altar activity in your own time. You'll also continue with your praise and worship, your cleansing. So when you first start doing the prayer altar, um, you may not find yourself going all the way into the, the final part I've been teaching of confessing and declaring and decreeing. When I first started, most of it was repenting and a lot of it was the word of God convicting me. So take it step by step. The first step would be to start reading the word of God in big chunks. Okay. And 10 chapters after a while, actually it becomes very realistic. If you find it's taking too long, you're a very slow reader. As I said before, you can actually use, there's Bibles now where it actually reads out the scripture for you. So at least it's being read out and you're hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, so if, uh, if you're part of our church, you can join a 10 by 10 group. If, even if you're from other churches, if you put say I'm interested in joining a 10 by 10 group, uh, I have one group that has other people from other churches as well so i could put you as part of that as well so in january 1st we'll be starting to go through the whole bible from genesis 1 so the first day genesis 1 to 10 second day 11 to 20 etc so check uh, from someone tim do you have any okay. advice for building prayer authors for families with young children someone asked a question Okay, um, the advice is that uh, what I gave you earlier, wraps, you would make it more more for the younger children. Like in when, I, when I'm 
uh, writing raps for next year, uh, the worship and the reading of God's word. I've actually found YouTube uh, songs for young children and also the reading of that word. I, I choose stories like Moses at the burning bush, etc. And there's actually videos for very young children to keep them engaged. The, instead of reading it out uh, together as a family from uh, just the words, you can use the, the video, which actually like paraphrases the, that story. It keeps the, to the main wording of the story, but for, for young children. Uh, so you can uh, make it shorter as well because their attention span is a lot less. So you can have worship using simple YouTube kids songs. There's lots and lots of kids worship, young kids and a Bible story. And there's lots, there's so many, almost every story in the Bible is covered with like cartoons for children. You can find those on YouTube. And then uh, the prayer, just, just simply, you know, pray with your children and bless, bless your children. It doesn't have to be that long, but just to have that time in the word, in God's presence is very, very precious. And you'll be surprised, you know, children are like sponges and they will really, really uh, just soak it, soak it in. Okay, if there's uh, no more, then uh, I'll split you into the smaller groups. And then after that, you can just leave. So in these small groups, practice blessing one another and bless one <laughs> another, bless one another that you will be able to have strong and effective prayer altars. So you pray something like, I bless you in the name of Jesus, the Father God will stir up your heart and enable you to read his word, to worship him, to go deeper into his presence and to build a strong and effective prayer altar. Just pray something like that and then wait on the Lord. Maybe the Lord will give you specific words to bless that person, even prophetic words over them. So take this time to bless one another. If you're not sure how to do it, you can use the, uh, the prayers that I have given you in your notes. <clears throat> There's example prayers there. They were on the PowerPoint, but they're also in the the handbook notes that I gave you. Okay, and once this has been recorded and put up onto YouTube, I'll send you the link of this as well so you can watch it back. And on all of the YouTube links, I also give you a link to download the notes with the answers if you didn't get all of the answers. So my prayer is, uh, this is not the end, this is just the beginning. And that you will start to build strong if you're building already then stronger and effective prayer altars if you haven't started then you'll build strong and effective prayer altars and if you want to continue you can say that you want to be part of a 10 by 10 group so that will give you accountability as well to i uh, so don't worry that's uh the, the group that i have it doesn't mean you have to be part of our church or anything like that it's just uh, an accountability group across different churches Okay, so uh, God bless all of you, and I pray that uh, every one of you will go away, the fire will grow, go stronger and stronger on the altar of your heart, and you'll build strong and effective prayer altars. So goodbye, God bless. Goodbye. And enjoy your breakout rooms. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Tim.